Good morning and welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. We're getting started about a minute or two late, which maybe it's an Irish thing because it's St. Patrick's Day. Maybe everyone has already started their festivities, so if you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, happy day to you. My name is Pastor Kelly Wadsworth, and welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are glad to be together marking this day, marking the Sabbath once a week as a community practice, as a spiritual practice, is something that we need one another in order to do well. We welcome into the sanctuary all who are here in person. We welcome those who are joining us online. It's good to have you. We welcome anybody who might be new or visiting for the first time. We welcome our members for whom this has been your spiritual practice for years, for decades. May we be one family together this morning. We have a special song a little later in the service that is going to be a bilingual song. First verse is in English, second verse is in Spanish. So a couple of instructions about this. First, if you know Spanish, we really need you to sing out this morning. <laughs> Secondly, if you're an English speaker, you don't have an excuse not to sing out because English and Spanish are both from romantic languages and there's a lot of things that they share in common. So I do expect everyone to give it a pretty good try this morning. There are many linguistic things in common, so we don't have excuses. And if you are not a Spanish speaker, this is going to be your chance, my chance, because I'm also not a Spanish speaker, to sit comfortably in a space where God is still present. God is present when we are in a space where our native language is not being spoken. God is still present when we are uncomfortable. God is still present when we don't know the lyrics to the song in front of us. <laughs> so this is as much our theological practice of being a Christian people even when something is not exactly designed for us. So on that note, be prepared. Our worship team will introduce it when we get a little closer. Let us enter into this time with joy and celebration. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to do the announcements really quickly. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I and pet grew up being Scottish my whole life, and I'm Presbyterian because my father was just so excited about being Scottish. And <laughs> my sister did all this genealogy stuff, and my father's father was born in Ireland. And <laughs> changed the spelling of our name so that when he emigrated to the US, he wouldn't be as um, persecuted as the Irish were. So what you learn as you get old, so. Um, make sure to fill out a sheet in the teal attendance pads. Leave the completed forms in your seat as you leave. If you're at home, you can use the QR code to tell us you're here, thank you. Get your free tickets to the Palm Sunday concert next Sunday, the 24th at 4 p.m. They're available online or put your hand up if you need one. Free tickets.
I did pretty well at that, didn't I? Um, donation items needed. This month, bring in Easter candy or small items to surprise and delight children at our annual egg hunt. The box will be in the narthex um, all through this season till the 27th. And or bring new or gently used gardening tools, gloves, even machinery to bless Marion County Food Share's youth garden projects. Bring items in by the 31st, that's Easter Sunday, two weeks from today. A wheelbarrow to collect items is in the narthex. Also, I just want to put a little reminder in your minds. Um, all of April is the Family Building Blocks uh, diaper drive, and we're going to be collecting diapers here. And I don't know, something about the looks of this congregation makes me think that you don't usually put diapers on your grocery list, and you go through that aisle pretty quickly. So start going down that aisle and dumping in some diapers. Um, and finally, I just want to congratulate Pastor Kelly as she starts her fourth year with us. I remember back when she was just, you know. Good morning, everyone. Shall we stand together and join in Let It Rise? join together in our passing of the peace and when you hear the music that is the signal to come back and join us in our next hymn
Please join me with the prayer of confession. Holy One, we confess there are moments when we desire to see and bring others or wish that your love was not for the whole world, but just a few, like us. But your love is bigger than our limited lenses, broader than our small scope of vision of all that love embodies. Help us to see the world as you do. Help us to love as you do. Release us from our need to condemn and set us free for love. For it is what you came in flesh to show us. Amen. Can you hear me? Uh, this is Let Us Be Known. And just as Pastor Kelly said, this is uh, the, the verse one is in Spanish. Verse two is in English. Um, if, if you're interested, the, the group that writes these pieces is called Porter's Gate. And they have different albums um, that are focused on neighbor songs, um, climate, um, social justice. If you're ever interested, look up Porter's Gate um, uh, albums. But this is, this is the one from uh, Neighbors. And it's called Let Us Be Known By Our Love, which we sang another version of that last week. Uh, so this, this will sound very different, but feel free to join us if you want to sing. It's low. It's very low in your voice, but feel, feel free to sing or just um, receive. But again, to, together we're all worshiping. Yeah. 
was beautiful. Thank you. It's time for the little folks to head downstairs, um, get to paint birdhouses today. So when you're looking for your kiddos, they're going to be downstairs after service. Good job, everybody, not jumping up and running downstairs to <laughs> paint birdhouses. Uh, the scripture this morning is Mark 12, verses 28 to 44. One of the religious scholars who had listened to them debating and had observed how well Jesus had answered them now came up and put a question to him. Which is the foremost of all the commandments? Jesus replied, this is the foremost. Hear, O Israel, God our God is one. You must love the Most High God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you must love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The scholar said to Jesus, well spoken teacher, what you have said is true. The most high is one and there is no other. To love God with all your heart, with all your understanding and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself this is far more important than any burnt offering or sacrifice. Jesus, seeing how wisely this scholar had spoken, said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared question Jesus anymore. Later, as Jesus was teaching in the temple, he went on to say, How can the religious scholars claim the Messiah is David's heir? David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, God said to my sovereign, sit at my right hand until I place your enemies under your foot. If David addresses this one as sovereign, how can the sovereign be David's heir? The large crowd listened to this with delight. In his teachings, Jesus said, beware of the religious scholars who like to walk about in long robes be greeted obsequiously in the market squares and to take the front seat in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. These are the ones who swallow the property of widows and offer lengthy prayers for the sake of appearance. They will be judged all the more severely. Jesus sat down opposite the collection box and watched the people putting money in it and many of the rich put in a great deal. A poor widow came and put in two small coins, the equivalent of a penny. Then Jesus called out to the disciples and said to them, the truth is, this woman has put in more than all of you who had contributed to the treasury. 
for they have put in money from their surplus. But she has put in everything she possessed from the little she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 2016, we, the Presbyterian Church USA, added a new confession to our book of confessions. And if you didn't know, we have a book of confessions, nearly 400 pages long, which technically is the constitution of the Presbyterian Church. It reaches back almost 2,000 years. We've got 10 plus confessions in it, and we thought, it's not long enough, let's add another one. And so we did. One way to think about our own book of confessions is things that needed to be said over the past 2,000 years. And in 2016, we, as a denomination, discerned that something else needed to be said. And so we adopted what was called the Confession of Belhar. It came out of South Africa, and it was the result of the Christian church in South Africa doing some deep soul searching about what was their experience with apartheid. They had a practice where the laws of the land funneled folks into some churches and into other churches. They ended up with segregated churches because they were following the laws of the land. They, because this was happening on their watch, the Christian church worked diligently to figure out how and why because they had a theology that was working at a very foundational level that was hard to recognize, that was contributing to the apartheid. And so the economic side of the house, the political side of the house, all had their jobs to do to dismantle it, and the church had its own job its own task to identify what were the ways, not just that they didn't like it, but that they <clears throat> were actively contributing to it. And so the Confession of Belhar starts with this question. How should the church respond when sin disrupts the church's unity and creates division among the children of God and constructs unjust systems that steal life from God's creation. It goes on to answer that question in the form of a number of statements of the things they believed and a number of statements of the things they needed to specifically reject. It starts off, we believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church and that this unity of the people of God must be active in a variety of ways. We believe that we love one another, that we experience and practice and pursue community with one another. We believe that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and of blessing to one another. Sounds good, right? Is there any of us who would disagree with such a lovely statement of what we believe? Probably not, but it's gonna get spicier. Therefore, we reject any doctrine, number one, that absolutizes either natural diversity or the sinful separation of people in such a way that this hinders or breaks the visible and the active unity of the church. In other words, we reject any reason 
in real life that creates segregation. It continues on, number two. We reject any doctrine which professes that this spiritual unity is truly being maintained in the bond of peace while believers of the same confession are alienated from one another. Which is another way of saying, we reject that we can have spiritual unity just in our mind, but not actually in the world. They need to show up in both places. Number three, therefore we reject any doctrine which denies that a refusal earnestly to pursue this visible unity as a priceless gift is sin. Which is another way of saying anything less than an earnest pursuit of racial justice and visible unity is sin. Anything less than the earnest pursuit that made everyone on the hook. There was no such thing anymore as being a passive bystander, having no opinion, not wanting to get involved, saying it was political. The earnest pursuit. Now that you are warmed up, let's see if we can identify some of the organizing principles of something a little closer to home. Weapons manufacturers. Why then, Pastor Kelly, why do we have to talk about guns again? Because when we understand the core operating principle of our weapons manufacturers, we will begin to understand how and why they are ending up in the hands of minors, which is a problem we are having right now in Salem with rising statistics of gun violence among our youth, robbing them of their lives and their futures. The city of Salem is putting together a violence reduction initiative, which is both good and necessary, but it is not enough. I have personally attended four community-wide discussions and presentations on the problem and the solutions, and there are some very good ideas out there, and there are some very committed people who are going to make a difference and it is all to be commended. But not once did we talk about the core operating principles of weapons manufacturers, which is profit. Gun makers are not nonprofit organizations. They specifically are designed not actually to make guns, but to make profit. Their boards are legally obligated to ensure profit in such a profit-based system. The fundamental allegiance of the advisory committee, the board of trustees, the CEO, the C-suite leadership, the marketing department, their obligation is profit as written in their bylaws, as written in the laws of the land that govern boards. They are all legally obligated to make decisions for their shareholders that produce profit. So let's be clear. What is not the core operating principle of gun manufacturers? Your safety is not, in fact, their core allegiance. Fostering a well-regulated militia is also not their core operating principle. Self-defense is also not their core allegiance because the core allegiance is profit. Thank you. Making more profit this quarter than last quarter is the fundamental shaper of all that is happening. And because a weapon, if you don't know this, it can last quite a long time because it is not consumable like a loaf of bread 
or laundry detergent, or even something like a computer or a car, which do eventually break after much too short of a time <laughs> after their purchase. So in order to make profit on an item that actually lasts a very, very long time, the marketing department is creating demand where there might not otherwise be any. And so we end up with myths, such as, more guns make us more safe. If so, a war zone would be the best place to be. There's more myths. Guns are our national identity. The presence of a weapon means I can hold the federal government accountable if I need to. More myths. Guns are safe. It's the people that are the problem. And I'm sure you can add to this list. None of those myths are the actual core value of weapons, weapons manufacturers, which is plainly and publicly available and stated as profit. And because of that, well-being is secondary to profit. Truth is secondary to profit. Jesus is going to weigh in on this problem. Our text this morning is the culmination of some tense interactions. And Jesus is very rapidly closing the circle on the core operating principles of the ruling class in the first century. First, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders at the time did not take kindly to him critiquing their profit motive, and they had already begun orchestrating ways to arrest him. They, because they were bent out of shape, began their campaign to make his questioning of the system synonymous with treason against Rome. When that failed, they tried again. This time, they used the tactic to make his questioning as synonymous with being unpatriotic. Finally, exasperated because none of those had captured him, they come at him with this question. What is the one thing that is true about all the decisions that you make, Jesus? That question will be the last confrontation between him and the ruling class before they silence him in this life once and for all. The way that verse 28 is worded is key to understanding his answer. So first, the teacher of the law starts off with this phrase, Jesus, of all the commandments. So let us remember Commandments were the laws of the land. They were not merely suggestions. They were not merely moral ideas. They were the laws that governed everyday lives, and there were 613 of them. So the question starts off, Jesus. Of the 613 laws of this land, which one is the one that all of the others fall into line underneath. When the scribe says, which law is first, that scribe is not asking an editorial question. The inquiry is not which of the 613 laws is literally written down first. That is not what is being asked. It's not even being asked which one is more important than the others. Like if you had to choose which team of commandments one wanted to be on. What is happening? The scribe is asking Jesus which philosophical principle is the prototype, the protos, because protos is the word that is used here rather than say like the number one. So which is the principle 
upon which the other 612 laws are fashioned after. And so in modern parlance, we might call this first principles. Even though it was Aristotle who articulated our Western conception of it, first principles are the things that don't have further reasons or proofs. We sometimes call first principles things that are self-evident. And they are the starting truths, the place from where we begin our human endeavors. If the terms truth and self-evident bring to mind another place in our culture where these words show up, you might be right. The second sentence of the Declaration of Independence starts off, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You are on the right track. The foundational cornerstone upon which the founders began the American experiment, however provisionally and imperfect, was one of equality among humanity as a basic fact and starting point, not one that needed to be proven or earned or deserved. There was nothing underneath it. It was the foundation. And so it's equality, not for those who are righteous or good or deserving. It is the baseline that then allows us to be righteous and to be good. So back to this scribe and what he was getting at. After he finishes asking Jesus, what is the basic premise of the entire legal system? Jesus answers, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a direct quotation from Deuteronomy 6, when Moses was preparing the people to enter into a new chapter into the promised land. This prayer is called the Shema, and it served as a daily prayer for those in ancient Israel, and it is still recited daily by many of our Jewish sisters and brothers. So when Jesus is asked, what is the most important law? He says, first, love God, and second, love your neighbor as yourself. Or more explicitly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We sometimes mix up loving God with loving our traditions and our habits. Sometimes we mix it up with loving our favorite hymns and tunes, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we mix it up sometimes with our favorite prayers and translations. We sometimes mix up loving God with what is familiar. We can mix it up with our privilege, our wealth, our race our native language, who we are friends with, the neighborhoods that we live in. But if God is love, then we can understand this first principle as, think about it, to practice it, to mature into more of it, to widen our capacity for it, to be known for it. And in true genius fashion, Jesus recognizes that there might be a love loophole, and he closes it. The love loophole is when our definition of love is too vague and therefore it ends up meaning kind of anything at any time for anyone, which then can end up meaning nothing. We can all point to things done in the name of love that were, in fact, far from it. If we leave love to exist only in our minds, it becomes nonsense. So Jesus gives it a definition and puts some parameters on what is love and what is not love. He says, after you have fallen in love with love, then the way to march it out to the world is to love your neighbor as yourself, which is the entire premise of the Old Testament. It is how the New Testament then formulates what we call the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
There is, in fact, no love of God without love of neighbor. And so loving your neighbor as yourself is another way of saying equality between neighbors is how we love for the most part. In our modern Christian culture, sometimes we get loving our neighbor all wrong. We might want to love only the neighbors in our literal neighborhood. Sometimes we're tempted to love from afar with warm sentiments, but no actual change in people's lives. We can be tempted to love people around us in order to convert them to our religion, to our thinking, to our denomination. Another myth of love in our culture is that being nice is the same thing as love, even if injustice continues. Scholar Ched Myers reminds us that the Leviticus tradition is of particular interest for it defines love of neighbor in terms of non-exploitation. The verse that Jesus cites in Mark 12 is the culmination to a litany of commands that prohibit oppression and exploitation of Israel's weak and poor. And it makes sense that love would be defined this way because they are just coming out of exploitation in Egypt. It was recent on their minds. Equality between neighbors is how we love one another. And this next part is really important. Love, as non-exploitation of our neighbor, is in fact the entire Christian tradition. It's not one piece among many. It is not part of the path. It is the whole tradition, dedicating one's entire waking life and all of one's thoughts and all of one's actions to this single premise. In this section, Jesus says this is the yardstick by which we measure our lives and our community. The yardstick is not calibrated on our effort or our intent. It's actually measured whether or not we have combated bias, discrimination, wage theft, disinvestment. The standard is not whether we think we are doing good. The standard is whether or not exploitation is happening in our community or not. To really drive this point home, Jesus continues on and says, while your own personal approach is important, it's not the ultimate yardstick. If there are others, in your community who are being exploited on your watch, you are responsible. If exploitation is happening anywhere, the Christian community is tasked with tackling it. To love your neighbor is to have parity with your neighbor, not just in our minds, but in the laws and the customs of the land. Jesus is talking about the laws of the land, and his contention is that equality in the law is the central concern of the 613 commandments. He's not talking about a separate religious tradition from political governance where legal exploitation happens over here while religious people wring their hands about it over here. The only definition of loving one's neighbor is to make sure that the law is not exploiting that very same neighbor. He doesn't even stop there. We might think we're ready for a breather, but he goes on to tell a story about a widow who is being exploited. And he uses the phrases, you are devouring widows' houses. What was happening at the time, it's not that folks were being mean to widows, it's that they were functioning as trustees of their estates and giving the widows some and keeping a large amount for themselves. It was legally authorized. One could do that 
if they were in charge of an estate. So they were not breaking any laws. Soren Kierkegaard wraps up love with this statement. The commandment is that you shall love. But when you understand life in yourself truly and deeply, then it is as if you should not even need to be commanded. Because to love human beings is still the only thing worth living for. And without this life, you really do not live. If we're to take this Belhar confession, we might adopt it for our own life in 2023. We might say something like, we believe to love God and to love neighbor shapes all that we do. And therefore, we reject any doctrine of the myths in our world that suggest that love is secondary to something else. We believe that the well-being of one another is in fact our highest calling. And therefore, we reject the doctrine of profit over people.
Thank you, worship team. Come alive indeed. This is our time to pray with and for one another. We are praying for the family of Sherry Coons as she passed away this past week when we know or hear more about a memorial or a celebration of life. We will publish that information. We are also praying this morning for one of our youngest members, Tristan Peterson, who had to go to the hospital last week for a deep infection in his leg. He is recovering from the first surgery and it is hopeful that he won't need a second and that he will be able to come home this week. So let us continue our prayers, starting with our prayers of concern. We'll go from this side over to this side. Oh, Mike's up there. And then we'll do our celebrations from here over to this direction. So let's start with Mike, who said, prayer of concern, please, for pain and pain control. Joy for you all, the time and talents you've shared with us, and joy for my in-house physical therapy. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's from Susan Tanabe, who had her knee surgery this past week. For this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. This is Nancy, and um, I am asking for prayers for Bill, who has a very important MRI on Wednesday that will set up for his surgery the following week, and he has to be able to be still for his uh, MRI, which is a challenge when you have Parkinson's. So prayers that he's just as calm and still as he can be. Prayers for Bill's upcoming MRI. For this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. This is Ariana. Just uh, lots of prayers as we go into our next week, which will start spring break for a lot of students. And although it's a joy for a lot of students to be off school and go on vacations. There's a lot of students that um, school is the safest place for them. So just a lot of prayers as we go into spring break. For our students and their upcoming well-being, for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. This is Peggy, and I'm missing my friend Beverly today because she called me this morning and said she dislocated her shoulder and is in a lot of pain. And she really is, was sad to not be able to come to church. So I hope it gets better. For Beverly's healing, for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Prayers for the love of the world. Uh, the, the news on Haiti this week was horrendous, and it's just a small portion of this world suffering because of lack of love and caring. For the suffering in this world, for our sisters and brothers in Haiti, for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, this is Crystal, and I just wanted to give you a little bit more detail on Tristan. He's been doing really well. Um, Jerry just told me that he went up and down stairs just fine, which he's going to have to do because we live upstairs. Um, but we are hopeful that he will be able to come home tomorrow, but he's going to need antibiotics for six to nine weeks probably. For Tristan's recovery for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. This is Dolores. And I like prayers for Bonnie Shaughnessy Smith, who's in Boise, helping her sister-in-law take her brother and move her brother into a, care, a memory care facility tomorrow. For Bonnie and her family in Boise, for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, this is Linda. Prayers for our friend Bill Hubble as he makes a move to Minnesota to be near his son. Uh, we wish him well and Godspeed. Prayers for Bill and his upcoming relocation for this concern, we say. Lord, hear our prayers. Um, for the continued dehumanization of the apartheid, 
of Palestinians in both the Gaza and the West Bank. For those suffering in Gaza and in the West Bank for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. This is Pam Garland, and I want prayers for my neighbor, Linda Mulberry, that was just diagnosed with breast cancer. For Linda, during this time of new diagnosis for this concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Holding our prayer requests together, deep in our hearts, let us also celebrate, be a people of joy, recognizing the goodness in our lives. This is Mary. This past few days have been beautiful with the sunshine and the cherry blossoms and the daffodils. We should celebrate. For the good weather, for the vitamin D, for coming out of our shells, for this joy, we say, thanks be to God. This is Linnea. I have been thanking God all week for the retina surgeon who worked on my eye this week in spite of some uh, difficulties my body threw his way. It's truly amazing, and I am extraordinarily grateful. For Linnea and her time of recovery from her procedure for this joy, we say, thanks be to God. This is Nancy again. I, I didn't think that it could get much better than getting a new adorable puppy. But in September, I'm getting my first grandchild. John and Meek are having a baby in September. For the new additions coming to the McMorris Attic's house, well, one has already arrived, the puppy. And for an upcoming grandchild, for this joy, we say, Thanks be to God. All right, holding our concerns close, celebrating with the good news in our lives, let us prepare our hearts to pray together as Nancy leads us in our communal prayer this morning. Please join me. As I arise each day, May the strength of God pilot me, the power of God uphold me, the wisdom of God guide me. May the eye of God look before me, the ear of God hear me, the word of God speak for me. May the hand of God protect me, the way of God go before me, the shield of God defend me the host of God save me. May Christ shield me today, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit, Christ when I stand, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. And we thank St. Patrick for that. Today we rejoice in a God who comes to redeem the world through a pouring out of divine love. Our rejoicing is offered with the generosity of our energy, our spiritual gifts, and our treasure. We are invited as God's beloved children to express our rejoicing this day through the giving of our gifts in love. May it be so. There's an offering box as you leave the sanctuary, or you may use the QR code on the screen or donate on our website. Please join me in our doxology, Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me.
Thank you, God, for loving us to the very ends of the earth and back. Your willingness to say yes to coming in the flesh to redeem our world through love and no to the powers of oppression has led us to give of ourselves generously this day. Take these gifts and multiply them across the world that you love so extravagantly. Amen. The next time that we will be gathered in this sanctuary, it will be for Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. The way Holy Week has been structured this year at Westminster, Palm Sunday will end at a point where the cantata later that afternoon will pick up. The cantata will end at a point in the story where it will get picked up on Good Friday. The Good Friday story will end at a point where we will pick up the story on Easter morning, four parts of one narrative. I encourage you to make the cantata part of your Holy Week practice this coming week. Where's Jeffrey with our extra tickets? He's out there somewhere preparing not to be mauled when you all leave the sanctuary. <laughs> to get your tickets. Our musicians have worked tirelessly on this concert. They are prepared. We have guests coming from some of our partner churches here in the city, so I encourage you to make it a part of your Holy Week ritual this year. Sisters and brothers, go in the peace that God promises us is ours in Christ's love. Go in that peace. Amen. Thank you.